one of my longtime friends uh, some years ago, when talking about things digital, said, Rob, they ain't toasters. <laughs> and so all of you, your first lesson for today is remember that. When we're talking about all this IT stuff, they aren't toasters, right? <laughs> Toaster, you put the bread in, you put the lever down every time you get toast. All right? Right, right. So well, let's, we, we haven't even started, Rob. So your, your timing is perfect. In, in, in full disclosure, we were going to get together a few minutes before the meeting, but we, as okay. you said, we had some technical difficulties with our toaster, but that's okay. Uh, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it now. So let me, let me just take the time to welcome everybody. And, and we've got, as you know, Rob, we, we, do, this, uh, we do this every week. Uh, yep. So grateful that, that you could join us for Crisis and Coffee this week, and uh, we're excited uh, excited to have you on. Um, so we typically come in and just have a conversation, but I know you've got a, a presentation that you're going to uh, walk through with us, and I'll, I'll make you the host so you can share your screen in just a second. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wanted to uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we've got... Uh, Pretty good, pretty good core group that joins us every week, Rob. They and, look really smart, Jeff. Yeah. Oh, they're smart. And um, don't let my image drag the bell curve down. They're actually very smart. So uh, we're, we're excited to have you. Marvelous. Delighted to be uh, all delighted to be connected for sure. So, so let me, so in, I, I, in full disclosure, Rob is a, a good friend of mine. We've, uh, We've known each other uh, for a, a long, long time. Back uh, when I ran corporate communications at Canadian Airlines, and Rob was the managing director at American Airlines. They had a they had an ownership stake in uh, in Canadian, so we did a lot of work together. Um, I'm gonna uh, Rob's Rob is uh, from Minnesota, which auto makes automatically makes you an honorary Canadian. I mean, I really I always tell I always tell Canadians that really close to the border. Uh, and I also add, I wish I was on the other side of the board. Right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Especially at a time like this, right? Yeah. With, a, with a clown in the White House. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, yes. Anyway, I had enough of that. Yeah. Discussion. But I am um, an, I'm, I, I'm an honorary Canadian. Uh, you, you are absolutely that. And you've, you have traveled the world well, and you have traveled Canada well. Um, and uh, you, so it, it, let me finish your, your official bio. You've, uh, you've, you've, you're a University of Minnesota gopher, so when people call you a gopher, you're not, ex you're not insulted. The rest of us are like, oh, no, 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 actually, gopher is the term of endearment. So one of my most prized possessions in life, Rob, was a University of Minnesota gopher's hockey sweatshirt that I wore around for years. So um, you've got your PhD from there. I know you, you, you spent most of your career with American and you were, it was with Republic, right? Did I remember? Yeah, I started with a small airline in Minnesota in a turnaround situation many years ago. That's awesome. And I spent a lot of time in American Airlines. Now you, you travel the world giving uh, lectures to, uh, to business schools. I know you spend a ton of time in Europe. You are truly, uh, you're, you're, you give Vincent Cavello uh, run for his money when it comes to uh, to traveling. So um, he he said he was the number four on uh, I think he's uh, on uh, United's frequent flyer uh, uh, list. So anyway, you are the person that pushed me to take public transportation every time I land, not just get in the back of that cab car that <laughs> I always love to do. And so I, I've told you a couple times, like Rob, I'm thinking of you when I'm on a subway somewhere. Oh, or, that's awesome. Anyway, it's good. All right, so. Without further ado, uh, super excited to uh, have you here, Rob. Uh, sure. We're gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to you to walk us through your, okay. your presentation, sure. and we'll have time for Q and A afterwards and, and just general discussion. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, let me. Uh, thanks again, Rob. Really, really. No, no, my pleasure. I'm delighted to be with you all. I wish it were in person, but this is second best. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. So I've made you the host. Okay. All right, so now me... you can share your screen and we'll all be able to see it. And uh, yeah, super looking forward to your talk. Let's go over here like this and put that into slideshows. Can you see the screen? We can. Wow. Technology marches on. Okay. <laughs> um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted to be, to be with you, as I said. Um, 
let's let's get started. Let's just dial through these slides. You know, when when um, and Jeff is exactly right. We've known each other a long time, and when he sent this invitation, and I was sort of envisioning, I guess maybe because it's my default setting, uh, envisioning a, kind of a you know a, one of my usual presentations, like I like I did. Um, uh, a couple of days ago with some uh, some business school students in China. And so I've got a deck here. And, and so let's get started. Um, and I'll just dial through the deck. Um, I, I think really quickly, because I think with, with you guys, uh, it'll be really more fun to have some dialogue when I get through this. But, but what I want to do today is kind of a, 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 a focus sort of broader than communications. I know that most of you are communications professionals. Uh, and that's a super vital role and really important. Uh, but what I want to do tonight, today, is to sort of share with you uh, five um, experience-based insights. So no theory, no stuff from a book, stuff that I learned from working uh, in an industry that is, by definition, crisis-prone, okay? Uh, and insights about leading and managing through the crisis. Time for Q&A. Now, I wanted to, uh, so here's a little bit more Canadian cred, eh? Uh, I wanted to... Uh, uh, how could I was thinking, how can I show that, that, that this presentation, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, this presentation has got, you know, this is, this is like the classic um, five kilos in a one kilo sack. I mean, there's just too much material for 20 minutes. Uh, contents are not hot, but as I say, they are extra light. And I'll send Jeff, in fact, I already did a PDF of the slides to the extent that any of you, any of you might want to look at them later on. Okay, so before I get into the sort of five lessons, um, I, I had uh, an email exchange from, with, a, with a colleague of mine, actually a guy who used to work with that American, a couple of weeks ago, and, and he's a numbers guy. He's the CFO at a great big company here in the United States. And he said, yeah, how big? 47 billion. That's a pretty big company. You probably can guess who it is or what company it is. So he said, Rob, I think that COVID-19 um, is, um, is as follows. He said, I think it's, hang on, I'm just my, my uh, there we go. He said it's 9-11 plus the 2008 recession times two. So that's probably, and that may or may not be right, but I mean, it is truly an existential crisis. I have, I've never been a jargon guy, uh, and Jeff knows that from years ago. I'm, I'm sort of plain speaking, plain English. Um, and I've always been, up until about two months ago, reluctant to use the phrase existential crisis. But that is where we are to get today in lots and lots of companies, not just in the you know, airline and travel space, but lots and lots of companies. But here's what I think, okay? I'm an optimist. I've been an optimist all my life. Smart organizations can and will survive this virus crisis if they have the will. And if they understand that in the wake of any crisis, whether it's COVID-19 or before or what may happen subsequently, it cannot be in the wake of any crisis, business as usual. So let's start with the five big lessons. Now, I'm offering these lessons mainly uh, in the wake of what we lived through after the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001 at American Airlines, when two of our airplanes were stolen and used as weapons. I lived through a lot of other crises in my time in the airline business. So this, these lessons are kind of a distillation of what, what I learned, sort of, as, again, as I said, sort of based on, on my experience of being in this, in this crisis prone industry. First of all, how do you manage with less money? Your budget is going to get whacked. And whether it's a small company that you own yourself or you're working for a great big company or a municipality uh, or whatever, uh, it's going to get whacked, okay? Uh, and so in times of uncertainty, you need to be prepared to make hard decisions, more fundamentally make decisions at all. And, and part of that is to learn to say no to all sorts of people that are going to ask you to do stuff. And you're going to have to say no because you don't have the money, right? Now, when we think about how we're going to manage with less money, how we're going to lead our way out of this crisis, one of the things that I always say is that there's going to be any, there's no substitute for sort of rigorous analysis and research. You know, we're gonna be inclined to do things on the fly, uh, but this is a moment when it's really time for critical thinking. So we're gonna to have to say, okay, you know, our budget's just been whacked 30% or 40%. How are we gonna cope with this reality? 
So I always say sort of at this time, this is the time to put on your, your critical thinking cap and ask why. Uh, and we, when we think about managing with less money, uh, I always sort of counsel, you know, really essential to be aware of two common sort of analytical pitfalls. One of them is over analysis, right? Hi, you know, analysis paralysis. You get 75% of the answer, you know, in a week or two. Uh, but, you know, you say, well, I don't want 75%. I want 100%. So it takes, you know, a way long, way too much time to get the rest of the answer. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we've got to strike a balance between, you know, a decision about money that's made hastily and one where it's just going to take us way too much time because we're dithering about trying to get the whole answer, right? So there's one. And number two, and I think, you know, this is a, this is a kind of a trap or a trick bag that we fall into whether or not we're in crisis. And that's what I call the cost benefit trap. You know, a lot of business analysis is based on what we might think of as cost benefit, right? So we, you know, we take out a piece of paper and we draw a line down the middle of it, a vertical line, and we say, okay, cost benefit analysis, here's the cost, here's the benefits. You know, and on the benefit side, we filled up the whole page. On the cost side, we're going to anything. And oftentimes, the reason that that's the case, there's nothing over on that side of the page, is because we cannot easily measure some of those things, right? And my counsel is always, just because you can't easily measure something doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? And that is so, so true. And the last point here in lesson number one is, when you make a decision uh, that has to do with money and you feel comfortable about it and you've done just the right amount of analysis, you go forward, you make the decision, you implement, but then you move on to something else. And what I say here at the bottom of this slide is always measure the results. Did what you thought would happen actually happen? So we say, you know, do the post audit. And that's very it's very tempting, especially in a crisis environment, to just move on, right? And never even take 20 minutes or 30 minutes to look back and say, okay, we took this decision about how we were going to use this money, how we were going to you know, make decisions with less money or less revenues or whatever. Well, did what we thought happen actually happen? So doing the post audit is really, really important. And even if we just spent 10 or 20 minutes just doing some back of the envelope calculations, it would be better than nothing at all. Uh, no, lesson number two, leading with fewer people, you know, you're going to have fewer people to do the job, eh? Uh, and so, you know, what are some sort of just some basic ideas about that? How do you lead when you have fewer people? One of them is you have to make yourself visible in a or not us. So post 9-11 at American, I mean, we, we stepped up the staff meetings to instead of, you know, once every fortnight or once a month, we were doing them twice a, twice a week. You know, and we're saying, you know, come on in, we're going to talk to you, we're going to help hold your hand and, you know, and, and we're, and, and I was, you know, the visibility piece as the leader of the department, I was the head of the advertising department after 9-11. And I was, you know, I thought my job was to walk around, you know, back in the 80s, you know, which is sort of when I went to business school, you know, they had this great phrase called MBWA, manage by walking around. And I remembered that. So visibility and communicating more and not less with your teams. Um, second point, key, key point here, acknowledge failure. Uh, your team, whoever they are, whether you own the company, or you're, you've got a group of people in, in, your, in your department. You know, I, I thought it was really important um, when, when you're in a situation where people are furloughed or people are sent away or maybe some people are terminated, uh, to be honest with people and say, look, we have failed you. Because, you know, to me as a manager and a leader, you know, one of the most sacred responsibilities that I would have here is somebody that I have to just admit, Jeff. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, was, to, um, was to say, look, we want to keep you on the, on the payroll. Um, number three, attack hierarchies if they exist. Um, this is, a, I, I think, broadly speaking, a crisis is an opportunity to remake culture. Uh, and, you know, one of the aspects of culture in a lot of organizations is that you know, rigid hierarchies exist. You know, all this, all this job, you know, definition based on job title and, you know, all, you know, d distinction made based on education and all that kind of crap. So good opportunity. Uh, create and maintain trust. Again, trust is really important all the time, but especially in, a, in the middle of a crisis, 
you know, creating and maintaining trust really matters, you know, to drive accountability and help develop your team and, and just to improve productivity. And, and one of the points about that is now, you know, you, if you're in a crisis situation and you've had to furlough people uh, or, or, or terminate them permanently or whatever, you know, you've got fewer people to do the work. Uh, and so you've got to trust them that they're going to get the job done on your behalf, terminate humanely. And then on the other hand, when you need to hire, um, you know, things will get better as time goes on. And again, whether you're in crisis or not in crisis, I've always viewed uh, hiring as an opportunity and not a burden. A little bit more in terms of managing with fewer people, uh, managing down, I, this is kind of repeated from the first uh, lesson, manage down everybody's expectations of work output. You know, they're gonna be looking to you to get stuff done and you're gonna have to look at them in the eye, uh, maybe via Zoom nowadays, uh, and say, look, we can't get that work done because I've got, you know, 30% 30, 30 fewer people than I did before COVID-19 hit. Um, next point down, time is flexible. This is a good opportunity to introduce to you or remind you of something called Parkinson's Law. Nothing to do with that horrible neurological disease. Parkinson's Law simply says the job expands to fill available time, right? And so that has all sorts of manifestations in the workday in terms of how we choose to manage our time. For me, one of the most important manifestations of Parkinson's law in the workday is you cannot spend your whole day doing. You have to put the, put the, close down the lid of the laptop, turn off the smartphone, get out a tablet of paper, and spend some time thinking, some quality time thinking. Okay, now the other manifestation of time being flexible in Parkinson's law is work-life balance. And especially, I mean, I remember when we were in the throes of 9-11 for weeks and months afterwards, you know, telling people, you know, at six o'clock in the evening to go home. And they say, well, I got all the stuff to do. I said, go home. The work will be still be here tomorrow morning when you come back. And, you know, when I counsel work-life balance, it's not just the idea. I mean, you go home because in, in my mind, in my long experience, you know, on the drive home or whatever, you know, when you got home, you're cooking dinner, you're working in the garden, you still are thinking about work. You're out riding your bike, you're at the fitness center. I often tell people, my best ideas come from when I'm riding my bike. Pay attention, again, in the, in the manner of sort of managing uh, your colleagues, lot, you know, their, their well-being, paying attention to their whole, their whole sense of being. Um, and uh, next point down here, realistic counsel on career development. I remember back 9-11, you know, we were in, and, and, and indeed, even after the sort of 9-11 crisis abated, the airline industry was then in, 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 still in a, in, in, in a mess in the U.S., uh, not related to 9-11, but just because of other factors. You know, I had to say to, you know, younger, younger associates, you know, they'd come to me and they'd say, look at you know, I'm, I, I, I'm really eager for a promotion, uh, but, you know, there doesn't seem to be much upward mobility. And I would be honest with them and say, you know, I'm not sure. I can't promise you when things are going to get better. So you need to do what's best for your family. And, you know, if your career uh, looks like, you know, if your career is promised and you think you can make a contribution, you know, at, uh, at RBC or the Bank of Montreal or wherever it is, you should go for that. Uh, and, and, and just be honest. And they'd say, well, I don't, I'm not a quitter. And I'd say, look, it doesn't have anything to do with being a quitter. It has to do with what you're doing, what's best for your career. And your family. Number three, and this is, you know, I might strip away one and two and really focus in on, on this third point. As I said at the beginning, in your, when you're in crisis, it's no time for business as usual. It's time to make bold decisions. And if you work in a complex company uh, or a complex public organization, the province of Alberta, the city of Calgary, wherever it is, you know, it's, you know, to the extent that you can simplify things, simplify the organization, you should do this. Uh, and when I, when I talk about simplifying, I guess I'm really talking more about, um, you know, in a, in, 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 in a private company, uh, but I think there's probably some lessons for people who work in the public sector as well. But when I talk about moving back down the complexity curve, 
Well, what I'm talking about is this, when, when companies grow or when organizations grow, inevitably they become more complex. They add responsibility, um, they take on new products or if they're government, they add services or, or whatever. And, and, and they do that because there's, there's revenue, whether it's tax revenue or, or, or business revenue to justify that, that additional complexity. But when the money goes away, as in crisis, uh, you, you need to kind of simplify and move back down the complexity curve and say, you know, things we used to do, we cannot do anymore. We may need to think about, about how we do it. Let me, let me give you some examples of, of this, about how we rethought the business with innovation at American Airlines in the period 2001 to 2003. We, we put a cute little logo behind it called the turnaround plan. But behind that cute logo was a lot of really hard thinking about process, about how we ran an airline. Uh, and so for example, one of the, th so we made a lot of really fundamental changes. And I'm gonna give you just three examples of the things that we did. One of the things that we did was we reduced the number of different aircraft types in our fleet from 13 to six. Now, just to, you know, I could go on and on as an airline geek about what that does for you. But one of the things that that does is it saves enormous amounts of money. And you think to yourself, well, yeah, I get that, you know, spare parts, but really the big driver of where it saves money is in training, is in training of pilots and cabin crew. So when, you re when we reduced the aircraft types from 13 to six, we saved tens of millions of dollars per year uh, in pilot training. Second point was we, we were reducing, and this is not just something we had started post 9-11 or post crisis, but we started to remove intermediaries from the selling process. This was when we really started to build up e-commerce, right? And, you know, started to take away, uh, try to encourage people to book directly rather than through bricks and mortar travel agents that we had to pay a commission to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the third uh, is something that nowadays we take for granted when we book. You know, once upon a time, you know, when you bought an airplane ticket, everything was included. As you know, nowadays it's like a restaurant. And that, that, the, the, the origins of that sort of a la carte pricing, you know, where you pay to check a bag, you pay for a reserved seat and all that other kind of stuff. You know, really the origins of that was in this one, we had to innovate and rethink the business back in, in a period of crisis. Um, lesson number four uh, is about conflict. Uh, it's gonna get ugly. Uh, one of the things that we know uh, is that difficult times breed conflict. You know, when you have to shrink the organization, when you have less money and fewer people, people are gonna start fighting amongst themselves, especially, especially fighting in large organizations uh, that have what I call strong functional traditions. So if you work for a company or you consult with a company where people are sort of siloed uh, in the organization, you know, there's the operations group and there's the marketing group and there's the finance group. Um, it's gonna get ugly, especially in those kinds of organizations, you know, where the finance people are gonna start fighting with the ops people and the marketing people are gonna fight with the administration people and that sort of thing. And so it really becomes the, the, the origins of this is really the competition for human and financial resources. You don't have enough money, you don't have enough people. And at the end of the day, some of the conflict becomes truly, uh, truly tribal in nature. Uh, and so learning how to resolve conflict um, uh, is really key, you know, to do that without, you know, hurting or alienating others. And I mean, let's face it, people, conflict resolution is not a skill that most of us are born with. We can learn it uh, by, you know, going to a course in mediation or conflict resolution or whatever. Uh, but most people are not inherently conflict resolvers. So learning how to resolve conflict by taking a course uh, or sometimes by simply just bringing in people from the outside, consultants to mediate the conflict can be a really good thing. Okay. And the fifth and last before we open it up for the free for all, which will be the most fun part, um, uh, is that in times of crisis, this is really when organizations, uh, their managers and their leaders uh, need a moral compass, right? A moral compass that points towards honesty, uh, points towards integrity, uh, points towards gratitude, points towards courage, uh, especially the absence of fear. These are scary times. They really are. 
but 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 we have to have courage because if we're afraid, it's going to make things worse. Uh, other value, respect for differences of all kinds, and it's really simply at the end of the day, it's really simply the golden rule. It's that we would at all times, not just in crisis, but particularly in times of crisis, that we would every day and every hour remember to treat others the way that we would wish to be treated. Uh, now, before we turn it over to, 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 to Q&A, uh, just a couple of quick points about, about the positives. Look at, I've been through all sorts of crises, terrorist attacks, uh, labor stoppages, um, all kinds of other uh, moments when, to use a technical term, the shit has hit the fan. And one of the things that we've learned through this is that, is that there is some, some inner strength that comes. We can do this as a nice four-letter, four-word phrase for the fact that we'll get through this and get to the other side. One of the other positive things that I know has come out of this is team cohesion. When we got through 9-11 in the advertising department, we had a much more uh, together team. We had a much more finely honed team uh, than we did uh, before we went in. Um, certainly more disciplined spending. You know, when your budget gets whacked, you know, you hate that. And when they first tell you uh, that your budget's going to get whacked, you go, oh, my God, you know, we can't do this. We won't be able to function with 30% less money. Somehow you make it work. And when you get through to the other side, you sort of think, wow, you know, that stuff that we said we had to spend money on, maybe we didn't. So more disciplined spending, better and faster priority setting. Honestly, and you've all discovered this in these two months that we've been in crisis, you know, you're a, lot, you're a lot more capable of setting priorities faster and better priorities than you did before. And greater perspective to understand when you're in an organization, no matter how small or how large, understanding about what truly matters. So ladies and gentlemen, a quick look. Uh, I apologize, more than 20 minutes, um, but now it's your turn. Uh, and I'll stay on for uh, as long as the coffee is still warm. Um, and off we go. Thank you. That is awesome, Rob. Thank you so much for that. Um, really, uh, again, really grateful you could be on here. I'm going to ask, because I know uh, she's got to go early, but Jody Mosley is on uh, our crisis and coffee. She uh, headed up communications at uh, YYC Airport here in Calgary, did a fantastic job for many, many years. Um, Jody, I'm going to start with you. Did you uh, have any questions or uh, comment on Rob's presentation? And then we can, we can open it up to the, to the rest of the group. Um, thank you. That's very sweet of you to say. Um, I, I think uh, I really enjoyed your, your presentation, Rob. It's great to talk to another aviation person. I'm, thank uh, you. It's a, it's a great industry for sure. Um, I've, I've also been through, you know, I started actually September, or I started in October of 2001 at the airport. So wow. yeah. some of the 9-11, but I was a summer student during 9-11. So it was a very interesting time for sure. Um, I did have a couple questions. I mean, I guess my first question is when I, when I look at um, just some of the crisis, how, how, how did you connect with your executive teams to really keep them abreast of what's going on, get them to get by those kind of conversations as well? Yeah, it's a Jody, great question. I think that, I think that comes back to that uh, point that was at the top of uh, the second lesson about managing with fewer people. I mean, in terms of process, um, one of the things, and, and I'm speaking now directly about, you know, sort of the, the weeks uh, immediately following the 9-11 attacks, you know, one of the most used, in addition to the regular meetings that we had with our team within the advertising and marketing planning group, one of the other aspects of process um, was we had, we had regular daily meetings with the executive team. And so, and that was very, very helpful. And so every day, literally every work day, Monday through Friday for weeks after 9-11, every day at, at 3 p.m., we would all trundle upstairs to, um, Mike Gunn's office. Mike was the senior VP of, of, of marketing. Uh, and we'd go into his big conference room and, you know, there would be everybody in the marketing group and oftentimes people from other, or other parts of the organization. So it was the chief operating officer, Bob Baker would be there and, 
and uh, oftentimes the CFO would be there. And so there was a lot of, there was a, a huge amount of communication within um, the marketing organization. So horizontally, but still within the, mar the marketing silo, uh, as, well as, a, as well as a fair amount of horizontal communication um, uh, across the organization. Uh, and that is, I mean, that's really critical. You know, and, and, and I think that, you know, and I think the key to that, I mean, part of it was obviously, you know, the, the, the chief marketing officer, you know, when he says, you know, there's a 3 p.m. meeting, I mean, everybody's going to be there and they're going to salute and say, yes, sir. But, 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 but I think there was this, I think there was an understanding, maybe inherently among people that, you know, an inherent understanding of this idea of Parkinson's law. You know, because, you know, the first inclination is, oh, my God, I'm too busy. You know, I'm too busy for, you know, a 30 minute meeting uh, every day. Uh, and yet, you know, we, we all went and, you know, we, we found that that was, you know, really super useful. So I think that, that, you know, that sort of communicate more and not less and communicate, you know, up and down the organization. And then if possible, side to side uh, is, is, is really vital uh, in a crisis situation. So, so, so that, that sort of sense was, was really useful. And of course, I mean, the, you know, the horizontal communication was, you know, people found that really, really useful. Uh, and, you know, during that crisis period, I mean, we learned more about how the operation was working, how the money was flowing. Uh, it was incredible. The really sad part, and I'll quit after this, Jody, the really sad part was once the 9-11 crisis abated, uh, in 2002, a lot of that really useful horizontal communication across the operations and across the finance, it went away. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, it was like, you know, and we didn't really, you know, we really didn't notice it going away because we kind of went back to the way that things used to be. And that's really a shame because, you know, one of the take, one of the goal, you know, the lessons learned in going forward is any organization needs to have horizontal communications whether in crisis or not it's, it's so it's so true and it's such a it's so disappointing sometimes when we fall into our old patterns because that's what we do best yeah uh, one other thing that I, I you know just to bend i guess get a little perspective from insight onto you as well as just the media fatigue you know when you start in a crisis everybody's hungry for information they they're looking for information you get regular updates you have your press briefings you have your press releases and then after a while like it is with covid there's less and less to say, and it gets repetitive. And trying to weed, like wean them off that a little bit without cutting it, has always been a bit of a challenge. To say, I don't have much more to say when they're still trying to fill airtime. Yeah, yeah, true that. I mean, and I think that yeah, and I, and I think that that I, it's and that's really it's really interesting to hear you say that because just in my uh, on my own um, over the past couple of months, you know, to the extent that I get involved in you know, nothing like what you're talking about in terms of a sort of a media update or whatever, but just in terms of like recurrent chats and conversations that I have with some of my consulting clients. And I think it's kind of the same. You know, one of the things that I like to try to bring up is just insights that I've gleaned from, you know, other places, right? You know, other sort of little pieces of positive news related to, to that. And, I, and I'll give you a really good example. I mean, one of the, and, 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 and I think that you know, because, you know, news tends to be, you know, people jump onto something and then, you know, it becomes the sort of, you know, news of the week. And at least down here, and I'm sure it's the same way up in Canada this week, you know, all the news media have been full of, of, of news about the vaccine, about, you know, vaccines and vaccine research and stuff. But prior to this week, I had been tracking on a regular basis, um, the news releases, the media releases that had come out of um, the the uh, laboratory at at uh, at, uh, the at Oxford University in the UK, uh, and their Jenner laboratory uh, is one of the world leaders in vaccine. And I and I still think today, even though you know all there's been all there's all this chest thumping about these American hospitals that are doing this research, the guys at Oxford are still way ahead of everybody in the world, right? So I've been you know I've been trying to sort of so I would lard in when I would talk about you know. A little bit of news, you know, some little piece of news from another part of the world, or some other little piece of best practice that other people are, you know, are doing. Just those kinds of ways to kind of keep things fresh, maybe not necessarily directly relevant to our organization, but certainly relevant to the larger crisis at hand. 
Definitely. Good word. It's it, but I hate using that word. It's one of those jargon ones, but yeah. Thanks very much. I appreciate your time. Yeah, you bet, Jody. Jody, before you go, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I, I want to loop back to uh, what, in one of your points, Rob, was um, to be transparent and authentic. And uh, I, I remember the moment, it, it wasn't a huge crisis, but it was certainly a, a, an issues management for YYC, the airport authority. I, I know you'll remember it well, Jody, when they had, they had taken a, a number of uh, parking spots, handicapped parking spots and um, uh, I believe it was Lexus, Jody, that that uh, given it to, and you know, all, in the hunt for all of us to look for more revenue, and and it caused a uh, a bit of a, a bit of an uproar in the in the community. And there was Jody giving an on camera interview, and she absolutely nailed it. She said, "Yeah, we got this one wrong. We made a mistake. Uh, it, this is not who we are, and just handled it so well." So. Shout out to Jody, Jody. If you want to comment on that, but but really, um, th that need for transparency and authentic authentic communication and really owning owning uh, owning the mistakes we're we're all going to make. I appreciate that. That was um, that was a really tough time for YYC, and I think we always had uh, the my philosophy has always been completely transparent and upfront. I like to it's plain talk, which is why. I think we always had a good relationship with media is that we, we were available, but yeah, we got that one really wrong. And I thought the only way for us to um, put an end to the story was say that we got it wrong and apologize. And it, I think that took the story that was national. And I mean, it, it was a fairly big national story at that point because it was a very dumbass move. Um, it, but it, what it did was really take a story that could have been weeks on end to two days. And I was able to, through really active social media, not just apologize to Lexus for screwing up, but also the community, the handicapped community that we impacted, but also everybody on Twitter who hated us. So it was an active campaign, but it was definitely the only way to be. You know, Jody, uh, one of the things that, I mean, turning back towards, um, and Jeff, you're exactly right, I mean, turning back towards communications. Um, I, I mean, I, I do a lot of, um, uh, I do a lot of teaching uh, at, in business schools on, 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 on crisis communications and crisis management. You know, and one of the things that I tell the students is, you know, look at, you know, it, just own up to things. You know, don't, this is, you know, there, and, and I, and, and, and be honest with people about this. And, you know, Jody's point about, 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 about owning up to mistakes and just being transparent and honest and just saying, we messed up. Like, what's so hard about that? And, 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 and it's just, and, and, and I, and when I talk to students about this, you know, I talk to the, the situations where, you know, where companies have just prolonged the damage by being in denial. And, you know, this, you know, this denial, which is, by the way, cultural, as you know, uh, is just, it's just such, it's such a wrong thing. I mean, it's a, just fess up, you know, and, 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 it's, and just be honest with people and just put on a humane face. And say, you know, because, you know, as you guys know, you know, one of the, in, in the world of crisis communications, you know, one of the great fallacies is that you never want to say you're sorry. And it's just like, well, we don't want to do that. The lawyers told us not to say that. And it's just like, that's just that's such crap. Such crap. Say you're sorry. It does not imply liability or guilt. But what it does communicate is you are a humane organization. And so, the only thing I will say is, and, and then I'll shut up and let other people talk, is that. I think when you deny something that's really obviously wrong, um, it's chum in the water and the sharks go for it and they will chew on it and chew on it. And what happens when you just, when you own up to it, it just, it totally dilutes it. They have nothing else to chew on. Because yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely a chum in the, chum in the water. That's a very, that's a, that's a wonderful uh, analogy. Perfect for uh, fishing season. Uh, and so true, so true. You know, and I'll just finish up, Jody. If I was advising you, I could not have advised you to handle it any better. So, uh, awesome job! You really deflated that. It was so impressive. I remember because it's so rare because um, I'm in the business when I see something so well handled in 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 the media. We've got lots of examples of of where it's not. But to your point, Rob, I believe there's uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Legislation in the states, right, that actually says that if you apologize, that does not that does not uh, imply liability on behalf of your 
the company or the organization's part. Yeah, it, yeah I think that's I I it's but it's, it's state by state. Right. Right. Um, you know, which is the, what you get when you have a federal system. Uh, but, but, but hooray for those states that have said that, right? Because, um, you know, that's a great thing and it's a great symbolic thing. It needs to be, it really needs to be the law of the land. I mean, it really does. Uh, now, you know, that, that up against, of course, the plaintiff's bar uh, and the lawyers, right, you know, who, you know, would say, well, geez, you know, that's going to be bad for business. <laughs> right. Anyway, so, yeah. I, who, else is, who else is on the line if they're, uh, other questions or comments, I'd be delighted to speak with you. I'm just scanning. I can't see the whole, so give me a quick, if you have a message or anything, you can either put it in chat or unmute yourself and feel free to, to speak up. Um, Rob, I wanted to ask you, you've got a, you've got a, uh, a great, I mean, you're right in, in DC there and all the uh, communication that's going on with the political leaders. I know you're up to speed on, 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 on Canada um, and what's, what's going on. You're, you're one of the most informed um, people I know when it comes to learning about other countries and cultures. I'm wondering if you could give a, um, your point of view, just generally on the, you, you mentioned in the federal system, the, the, you've got 50 states there, they're all, we've got 50 governors and states all communicating, it seems very chaotic from where we are. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're 10 provinces and three territories, and at times it seems a little, a little chaotic um, up here, but you know, and I've sent you these notes, like my heart goes out to, um, you know, my friends like you and a number of folks that live in the U S it seems, it just seems so challenging. I guess if even with the best of communicators and political leaders, this would have been a huge challenge. It, it, it seems, it, it, it seems to be even more. So I'm wondering if you could just comment on from a communication standpoint, uh, how it's been handled well and compared to well or not so well and compared to Canada and, and really your view, I'd be interested to hear and um, what, what you think um, could be done better given that, you know, you, you do have a federal system. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I mean, it's a, that's a, um, that's a, that's a, that's a question for, you know, an hours long discussion, but I, you know, I think that, and, and I can't, I don't know that I can. I don't know that I can add much value uh, because you know, can I, <laughs> one of the things I'm, I'm always stunned at is 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 is, is how much how much more Canadians know about um, you know things south of the border uh, than, than than I do. I, I was uh, just as a little fun anecdote. I was just before uh, I was grounded, just before the week got clipped. My last teaching trip, I was actually in Montreal. And I remember this very pleasant lunch with a couple of my McGill colleagues, and and they they got on the topic of you know who Biden should choose as his running mate, and and I didn't I mean I didn't know like two or three of the names of these people anyway. Um, so you guys know all this, but I mean the, look at the really the, the the real the real disconnect for all of you for and I think that everybody on the call except for me is Canadian and I'm a wannabe. Um, but I think the real disconnect, you know, to, to, to really the, the, the general point, and you guys, I think, know this, so this is not going to be, you know, Rob handing down Moses' stone tablets, um, is that, you know, trust levels, uh, our trust in government is so much higher in Canada, both at the federal level uh, and at the provincial level and indeed at the municipal level than it is in the United States. And, and I'm not saying... Um, I'm not saying that you don't have, you know, a polarized political situation in, in certain parts of the country. You do. But, 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 but polarization in Canada is like polarization light, right? It's like L-I-T-E compared to here. I mean, we've got, you know, these goofy nutcase people. Uh, and, you know, this is, you know, the, the polarized political situation we have in the United States, both at the federal level. Uh, and uh, in in a lot of states as well. I mean, states like Minnesota and Wisconsin, you know, that used to have, you know, a, a you know a two party 
political system that was much less polarized than it is today. You know, even those places are, you know, are goofy uh, in terms of, you know, people going to extremes and really more the, the right wing than, the, than, the, than people sort of to the left of the political spectrum. But, you know, that, that is really contributory. And, and, and there is, sadly, there is no quick way out. Uh, I mean, barring, you know, COVID-19 throwing us into a, a full-scale depression, which I think probably will not happen, um, there is no quick way out of this polarized political situation. Uh, the, the, only, the only way out would be for, uh, I, I think, again, you know, in, in the end of this all devolves to politics, you know, I think the only way out will be a series of elections, uh, hopefully starting with November, um, where, and I'm going to get a little political here now, and forgive me for any Tories in the room, um, but any, you know, really far right Tories, uh, or, or is that, you know, the Republicans to lose big, uh, and to lose the, the White House, and to lose control of the Senate, uh, and, and for that party to somehow wake up and say, you know, the party's been, the party of Abraham Lincoln, and the party of Nelson Rockefeller, uh, and the party of centrists that were in, uh, in, in control up until the 1980s and 90s, that, that party needs to come back and we need to remake ourselves. If that were to happen, uh, I think that a couple, that would be salubrious, obviously, for their party, but it would be salubrious for the nation. And it would also be good, I think, to the extent that it would help bring back the micro, take, take the microphone away from shrill voices on the left uh, that, that, you know, there's not many of them, but they get, a, they get the microphone a lot. And you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, the representative from the Bronx. I'm not even going to mention her name. Um, but those kind, maybe you like her. I don't know. But she's kind of a... So we need, we, we need, we need that to happen. This was the word, the COVID-19 was the worst possible time uh, for there to be a polarized political, and then by extension, a polarized media situation in this country. You know, for the people to turn on Fox News exclusively and only watch Fox News, and on the other side, for them only to watch MSNBC. Make it stop. <sighs> that was more than you wanted, Jim. <laughs> no, that's great. We appreciate your perspective, <laughs> officer. I'm going to go to, uh, to, to Laura Peck here. I think she's got a question on around the evolving uh, nature of uh, medical advice. But Laura, let me, uh, let me throw it over to you to ask Rob. Oh, did we lose Laura? Okay, so let me, I've got it in the, the chat here, Rob. And, and maybe this can, you know, you can tie this back into your experience around September 11th and, and how the situation was just, really started from a horrible unknown and uh, went from there. So when the message is changing, and for example, she said, you know, uh, the, the, the health messages from a month or two ago were you don't have to wear masks. Uh, the virus can't be transmitted that way to now. Uh, yeah. Please, please, please do wear a mask um, because that'll help stop the transmission. What's, what's your take on that, Rob, and, and how did that, that must have been a little bit similar to what you were dealing with that American post 9-11? Yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean, that, exactly, Jim. I mean, you know, really, and again, I think this is, you know, this is, I'm going to lay that, that, that whole sort of, that sort of whole changing health advice, medical message, I'm going to lay that firmly uh, on, um, on the, the clown in the White House. Uh, because, you know, his disregard for science and his disregard for the, for, uh, empirical medicine and all, because I think that, you know, had the CDC been given their proper due as the people that know more about epidemiology than anybody else, had they been given the respect and recognition, uh, from the political establishment, i.e. the man in the White House, uh, and, and the other people, from the beginning, I think that we could have had a more consistent set of messaging from the get-go. But I And funding, too, right? And funding. I, and, and, fund, and funding. Yeah. And, 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 and all that stuff, right? I mean, and all that stuff. I mean, 
and, and again, I don't know, maybe I'm being too critical, but I don't think I am. Um, uh, I, I think that, you know, you know, you know, you can, you can look back at, at three plus years of, of him disregarding empirical science, including climate change and all the rest of it. And just, you know, sort of before this, this all broke, kind of somebody saying, I bet he's going to, you know, be dithering on this kind of stuff. And, and, and he has, and it's just, it's just bad because, you know, to the extent that, I mean, he is for better or worse, the president of the United States, you know, for him to be counseling all this goofy stuff uh, is just, you know, has not been helpful. It's just simply not been helpful. So, so your, your point is leadership actually does matter. I, I, it absolutely does matter. And, you know, and um, yeah. And I think that, you know, the trust cuts both ways because, you know, for, you know, the, for those people that either are skeptical of his counsel uh, or completely, you know, hate the guy, you know, anytime he opens his mouth, even if he were to open his mouth in a sensible fashion, they would go, well, that can't be right because he lies all the time. Right. 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 I mean, we, we, I was, I was, you know, I was worried about that, you know, sort of two months ago when he, when it first looked like he was starting to get it. Um, so I don't know. And, and I know you and I talked that day, but when he had sort of his uh, uh, last really briefing that didn't, didn't go very well, I know a number of, um, I saw reported that even his, even his inner circle, even the president's inner circle was saying, uh, look, these briefings aren't working, right? They're not, they're not getting across what you want to accomplish. So um, yeah, interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to throw it over. I know uh, Ben, uh, Ben, if you're still there, did you want to, uh, you want to chime in about the evolving uh, yeah. medical advice? I know. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say, Laura, like we've been doing um, an awful lot of presentations and webinars, et cetera, on risk communication, primarily as it relates to pandemic and COVID. And inevitably, every group that we've been to, we always get that question about the changing message behind specifically wearing a mask and I, I put in the chat room a link to our web page um, the resources page and we had uh, we had Dr. Cavello and Dr. Heyer on last week um, arguably arguably two of the world leading pandemic health and risk communication experts and we talked about that and specifically to the masks um, so Cavello said two things and and he and just if you if you're not familiar with Cavello he has done the Ebola in Africa and the Wisteria in the Congo and, you know, three nuclear, the last three nuclear events and the Horizon incident in the Gulf. So he's kind of been around. Yeah. Um, and, and Cavello says this pandemic is, A, the most highly political response he's ever seen, mm -hmm. and B, the, the, the pandemic that has the fastest changing science. And uh, he, he and Dr. Heyer, they're currently working on a uh, document that they use to support all of the heads of states of health. And he's like, you know, Cavello said for the first time, we're having to update this at least every two weeks because the science is changing. And that's where the rub seems to be. When scientists communicate, they're very matter of fact. So two months ago, scientists would have said, Wearing a mask isn't going to help. Doesn't help. Where now, two months later, they're saying, well, it probably helps. Yeah. And, and from a scientific perspective, they deal in absolutes. From a risk communication perspective, so if we had a, got a hold of that, the message two months ago might have been the research today suggests that there's no benefit to wearing a mask. Or based on what we know today, we believe that there is no uh, benefit in wearing a mask. And then what that does is that two months later allows you to come back and say, you know, this has been so important and we care about our community so much that we've done additional research, we've done more investigation, and now we believe. And, and there may be benefit. We now believe based on our ongoing research that there may be benefit. So it's something as simple as framing, which is not something that maybe the scientific world is that, um, you know, skilled at doing. And it's just, they, they often will tend to deal in absolutes. Yeah, I think, 
Yeah, it's a super point, Ben, and I and I agree completely. And I, I'm just you know when I was listening to your talk, you know I was thinking to myself, and and I and I take your point exactly about 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 framing. I think that both uh, within, you know, in the midst of crisis, uh, and then you know in the interstitial uh, areas between crisis, I think what we need to work on when it comes specifically to this aspect of medicine and health is I think we need to work on communicating to the wider public that as much as we would like to think that science is, as you say, absolute, it does evolve, right? And I think we need to sort of do a, you know, it's almost like I'm a teacher, right? So I kind of tend to think in terms of lessons. It's almost like a, a science lesson that we could do now in the midst of the crisis that says, you know, I know that, you know, let, let's be honest here. I know, I mean, I'd love to see Dr. Fauci say, you know, let's have a little, let's have a, let's step back from all this. And let me give you a little science lesson about how science, how medicine evolves. And, you know, to use some nice examples, I mean, in the 1920s, you had physicians in the 1920s that said smoking was not harmful. They did. Now, Guess what, you know, from the 1960s onward. So, I mean, if we can frame things up in a way like that, that people can go, oh yeah, I get that, you know, it does change. And so to say, you know, that that is, and I, and I think that the other piece of, 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 of that is for there to be, along with that, uh, a little dose of, a dose, yeah, good, one dose, a little dose of humility, right, in this to say, you know, you know, to sort of, you know, while they are, you know, wearing their white lab coats with the stethoscope saying, you know, we, 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 we think of ourselves as highly trained people, but we are also people, we are also people. And things can change, circumstances can change. And so bear with us because we're now discovering that there is a benefit uh, in wearing a mask. So I don't, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a big, you know, your, your point about is sort of framing this up. I think that's, you know, that's absolutely right. And I think there's some things that we can say along the way, both in the midst of crisis. And then, as I said, also in these times in between, you know, to help people, you know, understand that a little bit better. I mean, overall, I mean, my larger issue is that I just would like, you know, more people to, uh, you know, pay more attention uh, to science in general. But that's and, you know, it's a, it's a great point, and uh, I smile when I say this. Ben reminds me, never use absolutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's you know, and, and Jeff, that's exactly right. I mean, there's moments when, you know, there's moments when sort of absolutes and utter consistency is really, really helpful, right? But there's times when it's not. And, you know, I always often like to think about, think back to, you know, where I, you know, the, the industry that I spent my entire working life in, you know, absolutes and consistency in the cockpit are really good, right? Because you don't want to kind of, you don't want to land close to the runway. You want to land on the runway every single time, right? So that kind of aspect of consistency is right. You know, the mechanic overhauling the jet engine doesn't want to sort of torque it to the right tightness. They want to do it. But, but then there's other times when, you know, the moment of relative and of perspective and stuff can come to task and can be very, very helpful. Totally right. Excellent. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm mindful of time. Let me just do one, uh, one more uh, circle around the table here to see if anybody has any uh, questions for Rob or any other comments that they, uh, they wanted to make uh, generally. We, you know, we, we say we stop at two, Rob, but we typically go a a few minutes over. So um, uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, for indulging us and sharing your experiences with oh, us. Glad to be with you all, for sure. Um, so I don't see anything. Okay, so let me um, let me finish up with this. What's the Robin? I'm gonna gonna throw you throw you this question, and any, anyone else um, help me with being hopeful for the future. What what do I have to look forward to from um, you know, how this crisis maybe is changing our leaders or, or how it's evolving, or even as we're growing as a community, what, what hope do you see on the horizon? Well, I think that I, I, I think there is, well, first of all, um, no, I think there's, I, I think there's, there, there, there's cause for hope, um, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a scientific sense, 
uh, I really believe, uh, and I've been tracking, uh, I've been tracking the progress on vaccines very carefully. Uh, I, I think we're going to see a vaccine before the end of this year. I think we're going to see a vaccine in the autumn. And I can't wait for that because I think that it's going to take a vaccine for, for society to get back to normal. Uh, because, you know, I mean, look at my last slide. Look at that little girl uh, hugging her father. I mean, we are, we are, uh, we are a social species. Uh, and I don't, I, I just don't want to live in a world where elbow bumps are the way that we interact with people. I can do it for a while. Now, to the larger point about, about who we are as a society, I mean, I would hope that one of the things that come, the, one of the things that comes out of this, um, certainly we see this in the United States, um, is, you know, we, we have seen unprecedented levels uh, of, of social cooperation. Uh, and that's a great thing, right? We've, we've seen communities pitching in and, you know, we've seen, you know, social cohesion and we've seen a rise, for example, we've seen a rise in volunteerism uh, and just my own testimony. Um, uh, it took, uh, I mean, we've lived in Washington for seven and a half years. When I lived in Dallas, I was a steadfast volunteer. Uh, it took me seven and a half years to find a volunteer home. It took COVID-19 to get, my, get me off my backside. But now I'm a volunteer once a week in a food bank. Uh, and if you, so that whole, that whole aspect of volunteerism, of social cohesion, um, of those kinds of things, those are positives uh, that, 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 that don't generally, they don't generally go away once people can see the, the emotional benefit of social cohesion uh, and the fact that, you know, you know, getting to know our neighbors and trying to help out more vulnerable people and the lady down the street that's 60 years old that needs to have her groceries delivered, those things won't go away. And I think, so I think in, in that respect, I think those are, those are really good things to have. And, and Canada, uh, you know, Canada, just by, by nature of who you are as a more trusting and more collective society, you know, Canada's already, you know, before COVID-19, you know, was already at a higher level, and those levels have been have been increased yet more. We have a long way to go to catch up, but but we've made, I think, in the last couple of months, some great progress in that respect. So that's a good thing. And, and I think that you know, just to yeah, you know, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, and, and to your point about innovating during a crisis, like a lot of um, um, you know, for example, out of the, the the bubonic plague in the 1300s, how we treat human waste, like all our this, the, the sewage systems that, that sort of developed that concept. Like there's a lot of things that came out of some very horrible events in human history, a lot of innovation. So, Yeah, no, that's, ab that's absolutely right. And, 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 and breakthrough, uh, breakthrough developments, not just in the sense of a vaccine, but just in the other, you know, in the ways that we would, that we would manage these, these situations in the future, manage them better. Um, because, you know, the, if you read this, you know, that is, you know, optimism and hooray, let's, let's, let's see the vaccine coming. But, you know, the likelihood of the, the epidemiologists and the virologists tell us, you know, that there's going to be these interspecies transmissions in the future, right? You know, we can have a vaccine for COVID-19, but then there's going to be, oh, lo and behold, something else hopping over. And just be more innovative about how we manage um, those outbreaks in the future will be, I mean, that's, you know, that's going to be key. That's going to be key. Absolutely right. right. Yeah. For sure. Well, we are, uh, we're coming up quarter after. Um, Rob, want to thank you so, so much for joining us. Absolutely love your, uh, your uh, presentations, your big brain, your enthusiasm. Really great to uh, connect with you over Zoom. I want to thank everyone else that, uh, that joined us to listen in to, uh, to Rob and uh, join us for Crisis and Coffee. A reminder, we do this every Thursday. 3 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock Mountain, noon Pacific. Um, and so come join us. Drop in. You do have to register. That's why we have to uh, admit people. We, we, had, we had one, Rob, where we were uh, Zoom bombed with <laughs> a bunch of hilarious, uh, if inappropriate, photos. But So that's why we've had to set up the, the password. So we did have uh, – we, we, we do have a, a bit of an admittance system. So, yeah, that's a, good, um, that's a good thing to do. Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks, yeah, thanks listen, again, no, everybody. Rob, thank you so much.
Yeah, before you cut me off, just one last thing. Uh, delighted to be uh, and honored to be invited. Great to be with you all. Um, yeah, you can see on that last slide uh, my email address, and, and Jeff can make the I've, I've emailed the PDF to Jeff, so Jeff, feel free to post that or whatever, send it out. Um, and, um, you know, if you have a question or a, a follow up, uh, you know, I always like to say at the end of these presentations, you know, I come with a lifetime guarantee. Uh, on the other hand, I am 68. So uh, get those, get, get those, get those questions to me soon uh, and, I'll, and, and connect via LinkedIn. And, uh, and if in the future I can be helpful to you, uh, I'd love to be. So thanks again, Jeff, and you all are great to be with you. That's awesome. Signing Thanks off. a lot, Rob. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll talk to you next week. Signing off. Bye.